Good evening, everybody, and welcome to the Forum in Norwich, where, for some remarkable and amazing reason, we have Michael Neal, one of the most <laughs> um, amazing coaches, here to talk to us all this evening. Um, Michael is an author, a super coach. I was going to try to remember some of these numbers. I think you've got six best-selling books, uh, which have sold over 7 million copies, translated into 23 languages, and uh, for, as I say, for some reason here in sunny Norwich. <laughs> they totally lied in the brochure. <laughs> and we've been lucky enough to have uh, Michael working with us today at Fountain, um, doing a bit of work with our team, um, and also as a guest on the podcast that I host with Emily Groves. Um, so I'm really excited to be releasing that episode later on in the summer. Um, but for this evening, before we jump in with a great conversation, as I'm sure it will be with Michael, um, Marcus is just going to explain why on earth Michael is here from LA to Norwich. Um, so I'll hand over to you, Marcus. Thank you. I'd like to take you back to the 18th of September, 2018. It's a day I'll, I'll never forget. I woke up and I'd lost feeling in my arms and legs. Now, I don't know if any of you guys ever had a health scare at all, but I didn't handle it well. I was absolutely terrified. It was only exacerbated when I went to see the GP. And he said, like a lot of GPs say at the beginning, no idea. <laughs> but he actually seemed really concerned and said, if this gets any worse, go straight to A&E, which didn't fill me with much confidence. So the next seven days were an extremely long week of fearing I might actually die, which feels really stupid saying that standing here now, but that's what I convinced myself of at the time with the thinking I had going on. I convinced myself I had motor neuron disease or, or something similar. And what's amazing is, around that time when you actually think that the end is near, you, all your priorities change. I mean, that week I spent so much time holding our four-year-old son close to me, trying to sort of save her every minute with him. On the phone to my parents, extremely worried. And I decided to pay to see a neurologist, because the NHS said it's going to be, I think, a six-month waiting list, and get some answers. So I went to see a neurologist at the end of the week and had an MRI. Good news, neurologist tells me, you have functional neurological disorder. To which I replied, that sounds absolutely horrific. How is this good news? He told me that my body was functionally fine, that my hardware was working. It was just my software that was glitching. And when I asked what was happening, he told me that I'd burnt out. You see, I hadn't taken a holiday for over 18 months, despite Rebecca's insistence. I think I used to call them liabilities, yep. loss-making activities. <laughs> yeah, I'm amazed she's still with me as well, guys, honestly. I mean, I've been working evenings and weekends, and I was telling everyone, saying, Rob, I'm all about the hustle and the grind, you know, listening to Gary V and like, gonna go and smash it, you know. It's called hustle porn, apparently, that sort of like, you know, <laughs> memes around the internet. I remember I was working one weekend and I shared a Facebook picture of Harvey Specter's face. You know Harvey Specter from Suits? Saying, if you want an easy life, I hear McDonald's are hiring. So I was that kind of guy, I was a bit of a dick last year, and again, Rebecca <laughs> stayed with me. <laughs> but from my body's perspective, I was in fight or flight. 12 hours a day, six days a week, and my body was now telling me to stop. And now the doctors were telling me to stop. I had to stop, or things were gonna get worse. So with the amazing support of Rebecca, and my two co-directors, Rob and Laura, I embarked on a five-week sabbatical. So it's the longest I'd ever taken off. But of course, that couldn't be a nice long beach holiday, as uh, appealing as that sounded. I had to use the time to make a real change in my life. So I decided to invest a fair bit of money and spend three days with Michael Neal. You see, I've come across Michael's books in the past and always felt better after reading them. I often use his content to get me through my sort of hectic, whirlwind, manic lifestyle. And I figured at the time this needed a bigger dose of Michael's content, and I could go back to smashing it in the office. <laughs> However, to say I got a bit more than I bargained for, as you remember, Michael, would be an understatement. So we embarked on a three-day conversation, <coughs> and I went through something that I can only really describe as a, a bit of a transformation, which feels a bit woo-woo saying that sort of language, because that's not normally the, the words I'd use. But soon after, feeling came back in my arms and legs. I started falling in love with my life again. Work now seems a bit easier. Life a bit less stressful. I'm actually doing some of the best months in Fountain's history, so that, that's pretty cool as well. When we first met, Michael asked me a really simple question. What would the miracle be? 
I'm really happy to say that the miracle life I dreamed up back then is actually kind of the one I'm living right now. So thank you to Michael and also to a lot of people that helped me through that period. And you know who you are. There's quite a few here this evening. But why are we here today? Well, as I shared my story both in person and online, so many people in the business community sort of opened up. A lot of you here tonight actually and said they were feeling close to burnout as well, that they were struggling. And everyone seemed to be quite stressed at the minute. So directors at Fountain and I wanted to put this event on whilst Michael is here training some of our guys. And as you can tell by the ticket prices, we're, we're running at a bit of a loss. And we're giving out Michael's books for free at the end. So, you know, it's, we're happy to do that. But the truth is we don't really care. We wanted Michael here to share his message with the Norwich business community <coughs> because it's a community that's helped us so much over the last <coughs> 10 years. You see, we first started in the darkest days of the financial crisis and all we really had was an abundance of energy, hope and enthusiasm, but there was so much we couldn't see. And many of you in the Norwich business community were kind enough to donate your time, your wisdom, your experience to help us see the light and get to where we are today. A wonderful team of 40 people, Google's global award winners for growing businesses online, and an incredible culture that makes every day worth it. So this is our way of saying, Thank you, Norwich. See, Michael, you're a thank you gift. I hope you don't mind being, <laughs> being given as a gift. But everyone I speak to talks about what an incredible place Norwich is to do business. And it really is, isn't it? We've got good ed entrepreneurs. We've got all sorts of people. And I think it's actually for one reason. People care. We're human first, business person second. Which is why I know Michael's message will resonate with so many of you here this evening. My hope is that you find this talk not just interesting, inspiring, <coughs> but most of all useful in your lives. And maybe you might see something new tonight, because it doesn't have to be this hard. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome up to the stage, all the way from Los Angeles, <laughs> Michael Neal. Hello. I always sound so important when they do that, you know. Gosh, I can't wait to see what he says. They, uh, well, actually, I asked uh, Marcus and Rebecca earlier today what the title of the talk was. You would think that I would have asked that earlier, but it just, I, it would, I, I'm coming off a week of, of, of speaking and working, so it just, I, I just, okay, what's, what's next? We're going to Norwich. Where's that? Up. Okay. Um, and... Uh, <coughs> And they said, well, it's called An Evening with Michael Neal. And I said, I got it. <laughs> <laughs> but I think had we, had they asked me for a title, had we decided, let's put a title on it, I, I probably would have called it Falling in Love with Your Business. Because fundamentally, that's the best, that's as good as it gets. If you can fall in love with your business, fall back in love with your business, hopefully, or fall more in love with your business, you're going to do great. For those of you who aren't here for your business, you can retitle the talk, Falling in Love with Your Life. Because essentially, when we are in love with our business, of course we still want it to do really well, but we don't stop loving it when it doesn't. Right? I hope you don't stop loving your kids when they do poorly at school. <laughs> if you do, we'll have a talk on parenting another time. <laughs> But you recognize, of course you want them to do well, but it's just the joy of watching them learn and the joy of watching them kind of step out into the world and, and grow up and do things. Well, it's the same with our businesses. If, if I said to you, why are you in business? Probably some of you would say, well, to make money. Fair enough, that's kind of what makes a business a business. You know, or you might say, well, there's this thing that we want to do in the world and the business is a vehicle to do that. Again, great. But most of us spend a fair amount of our time in business. And it's really worth being in love with it. And so what I thought I would do this evening is share a few client stories of people who were kind of in situations, you know, nobody's quite like Marcus. <laughs> but there are people who are as burnt out, strung out, <laughs> and, and overworked as he was. And and through kind of sharing those stories, hopefully give you a sense of what's on offer. Not on offer from me, but on offer from life, as it relates to work, as it relates to just how you live. And then I'll open up for questions. 
So whatever might be relevant for you, and I'll do my best to answer. Would that be a fair, fair use of our time? Yeah. Okay, well, I've got one. Anyone else? <laughs> you know, <laughs> we can outvote him. You know. So the, the, the first story that came to mind was I had a client sent to me by his wife. It happens. <laughs> uh, and, and he ran a large organic pet food company. So they had, I don't remember their turnover numbers, but they turned over about 10 million a year. They had about 50 employees. They'd been in business for over 20 years. And when I asked why he wanted to come out, he said, I don't, but my wife is telling me I have to. So I said, can I talk to her? <laughs> and he said, yeah. And so she'd read one of my books, The Inside Out Revolution, which I think is one of the ones that you've got. And and she said, I really think that this will help him because he's so stressed that he's going to sell the company for a loss just to get out. He's so overdone that he just wants out. And I said, look, before you do that, go spend three days. Go spend some time with Michael. And he said, and, you know, so I am. So he came out. And people often say they're stressed. Right? They'll tell, oh, it's really stressed. But when you talk to them, they're just a little bit worked up. They're a little bit caught up. He was like death. Like he was like, <laughs> I think he was, he was possibly slightly medicated. <laughs> you know, he was like a few too many Xanax on the plane or something. Um, and, but it was okay because I get it, right? We do what we know to do to settle ourselves down. Because we know we can't run at full amp all the time. And if we don't, our bodies will, right? If we don't shut it down, our bodies will shut it down. And so it didn't worry me that he was like that. I kind of I got it. And I kind of knew that if we looked towards how this whole mind, the human mind works, good things would happen, because they always do. Because when you understand how the equipment works, it works better. I, was, I ran into some lovely old friends, David and Violetta, at the beginning of the talk tonight. It just made me think of, uh, they came to an event I ran in Mallorca. And one of the reasons I remember that event, besides the fact that it was a lovely event, is because I couldn't get the freaking door to my balcony open and it was driving me nuts. <laughs> so I'm in this beautiful place, it's sunset, I've got this room with a balcony and I am trying everything and I'm trying the handle and, and I think it's locked and I, I call down to the front desk and. And they're like, well, did you try unlocking it? Of course I tried unlocking it. And, you know, very sensitive, enlightened man that I am. <laughs> and, uh, and finally they sent somebody up. And it turned out it was a sliding door. <laughs> <laughs> now, I didn't need somebody to teach me how to open it. I needed to know how it worked. I kind of could have taken it from there. Well, so much of what we're up against in our businesses is not that we don't have the skills, that we're not good enough. It's, it's that we don't actually understand the equipment that we're using. We really don't understand how the mind works. Because we have sort of either never looked or we've been told it runs on positivity and motivation and passion, which sounds lovely when you're 20, <laughs> but gets increasingly tiring as you grow on. And, and so I, I Talked to this man, he's, he's a, a lovely man, his name was Ward. And we, we talked about human nature. And we talked about the fact that we're not born stressy, right? Babies might be a little colicky from time to time, they might be fussy, but they're not stressy. They kind of take things in their stride. They kind of enjoy life. They don't need a lot to entertain them, right? Your car keys will do it. And, and, and they don't care if they're Mercedes car keys or Volvo car keys, right? They just like the shiny, jangly bits. But somewhere along the way, we start thinking we need more to entertain us. We need more to make us happy, to make us okay. And we start chasing it in the world because it really looks like happiness comes from the world. If we have the things we want, we'll be happy. If we don't get the things we want, we'll be unhappy. And so, fair enough, we, we go after them. 
Now, what's interesting is I don't know why that idea persists if you look around. Right? If you read OK Magazine, you read Hello Magazine for six months, you'll see the same people who are on the cover. Oh, their happy new marriage. Oh, their amazing new life. Oh, the tragedy. Oh, the divorce. Oh, the bankruptcy. Right? It, it doesn't stand up to any scrutiny at all that getting everything you want will make you happy. But we continue to chase it as if it does. So essentially what I talked with this guy about is, is we just talked about how at our core, where he was American, I could get away with saying we're made of love. I would never say that to you guys. <laughs> we're made of aliveness. <laughs> right? Right? We're made of whatever life is made of. Right? We are alive. And it, it turns out that's more than enough. That the actual feeling of life in us is what we crave. And if you think about your favorite experiences at work, your favorite experiences in life, I promise you they were about love and they were about that feeling of aliveness. Whether it was laughter, whether it was twinkles and sparkles, whether it was the excitement of chasing after something or competing in something that you were really enjoying competing in. It was that sense of engagement with life, that sense of life coming through you that you loved. That's what thriving is. Thriving is a measure of aliveness. It is not a measure of profit. It is not a measure of success. It is a measure of aliveness. If, if I showed you 12 gardens, you would know which garden was thriving by the aliveness of the garden. If I showed you 12 businesses, I could tell you which ones were thriving by the feel of them. I wouldn't have to know anything about the bottom line. I wouldn't have to go through the books. I wouldn't have to spend too much time with the people because there's a feeling of aliveness. There's a feeling of sparkle, of twinkle, of freshness. That's what we crave. That's also what makes our business run because I would also be able to predict which of those businesses would be the most successful in the next year. Pretty accurately from experience. I've been doing this 32 years. Simply by seeing that which has the most life tends to do the best. Not a guarantee, right? You try and plant a rose garden in the North Pole, my guess is it can be thriving on the inside as much as it likes, but it'll still be dormant, right? There are some ideas whose time has not yet come. <laughs> but on the whole, all other things being equal, the business that's thriving, that is filled with life, the people that are thriving, that are filled with this aliveness, do the best. And so I said to him, look, that's natural. That's what's there. Why don't we all feel it all the time? Because what sits on top of aliveness is thought. We think. And we think and we think and we think and we think. And the more we think, the more solid life seems. The more real everything seems, the more problematic everything seems, the more <laughs> important everything seems, the more urgent everything seems, the more our insecurities seem real and not like, ugh, yeah, I just got up in my head for a minute. And so then the more we start to try and deal with these insecure thoughts, we try and kind of avoid things that we're worried might happen somewhere in the future. We try to cope with things that we think we, we are, are going to be problems not just now, but always going to be problems and are only going to get worse. We try to cope with imaginary futures. We try to prevent imaginary futures, not by reimagining them, but by taking action now that we think will help us avoid them. Which is a really interesting way to do things. And we don't question it because everybody else is doing it too. But it actually makes very little sense. I had a, I had a, um, a client who, who, who came to see me. He's in the television industry. And before we started our session, he told me about the dream he'd had the night before. I don't do dream interpretation. But he told me about the dream he'd had the night before. And it was a pretty funny dream to my mind. Because he, um, what's the guy's name, Jamiroquai? 
and Saddam Hussein. <laughs> um, we're on a private jet to Russia to spend a weekend doing blow with hookers, if I'm remembering correctly. <laughs> um, I'm assured blow is a drug. That's, uh, um, and, uh, <laughs> and, and so he's, and he said, and I should have known it was a dream because we flew out of New York. <laughs> I'm like, that's how you knew it was a dream. <laughs> Saddam Hussein had been dead for several years at this point, but okay. <laughs> and he said, and I realized, like in the first hour, that Saddam Hussein was sleeping with Jamiroquai's wife. And I just was really stressing because like, I really felt I owed it to Jamiroquai to tell him, but I didn't want to ruin the weekend. <laughs> and it's something I woke up in a sweat. And where, I mean, he was laughing in fairness, <laughs> but it was like, so that was the beginning of the session. So as we talked, we had the same kind of conversation because it's the same conversation I have with everybody because it's the same for everybody. We are made to thrive. We are designed to thrive. We are made of aliveness, of creative energy, of creative spark. But it gets covered over. We're all up against the same thing. Our thinking about the future looks more and more real to us. Our insecure thoughts look less and less like thoughts and more and more like predictions of, of what's going to happen. And so it kind of squashes it. And he had an insight. And by the way, that's whatever you take from today is going to be whatever insights you have. It's not going to be anything I say as such unless you recognize the truth of it for yourself. It may be something that just comes to you as we're talking. It doesn't even have to directly relate to this. But what you see is what you get. So he had an insight as we were talking. And his insight was that he had totally made his self-worth dependent on how his career was going. Not unusual. It was news to him. And he got, I was telling the group earlier today, he, he got visibly younger and handsomer. It was funny, because of course, when the stress peels off, you're, you're very, you're, you just are more alive. The aliveness shows through. We used to actually had a, a, a colleague who called what this work, the, the five hour facelift. <laughs> because if you take a picture of somebody before, and then the thought starts falling away, and the aliveness starts coming through, they look visibly younger. It's pretty universal. So I was talking to him about it. And, and so he could see, oh my god, I've been driving myself crazy. I've been driving everybody else crazy. That's why he was sent to me. But, but it was a beautiful moment right up until I could see him start to shut down again. And I could see him get serious again. And he said, right, what do we do about it? And I said, what do you mean? And he said, well, what do we do about my self-worth issue? And I said, well, I mean, in fairness, that's like asking me, what, what, what do we do about Saddam Hussein sleeping with Jamiroquai's wife? <laughs> it's only happening in your head, so we don't really have to do anything about it. It doesn't matter what you do in a dream. You don't have to fix it after you wake up. Now, unless you're married to my wife, <laughs> in which case I have had to apologize for things I've done in her dreams. <laughs> but generally speaking, we understand how dreams work. Right? We understand that what happens in our dreams, real as it seems at the time, real as the feeling of it is, even we might even wake up still in it, you know that feeling of sort of still being kind of freaked out about something that happened in your dream? But fundamentally we get it. We get, oh man, thank God that was a dream. And we get on with our day. Well, it's all a dream. We live in a world of thought. We live in a dream of thought. It seems really real until it doesn't. And then we're back in the room, right? Where it's like, oh, hello. <laughs> right? You know, and you may have had that experience where you suddenly kind of come back to yourself and you're like, wow, where have I been? And hopefully it's just you haven't been gone that long, but sometimes people can be gone for quite a while before they come back. When you're back, you're good as new. It's like it never happened. We don't understand thought works the same way. Our daydreams work the same way as our night dreams. They seem incredibly real until we wake up. And so I was talking to my, my, my first client, the pet food guy, about that and about the nature of thought. And I could see he was seeing something because he was, <sighs> he was exhaling. Right? You know the phrase, waiting to exhale? You know, I'll, I'll relax when the check is cleared. Well, 
he began to exhale. And of course, when you exhale, you inhale. <laughs> That's called the basics of life, right? We're made to do that. We work really well when we exhale and inhale, right? We don't do really well going, <gasps> okay, let's work. So he began to exhale, he began to relax, he began to open up, and he began to settle down, right? If there was one thing that I would give, and I don't tend to give advice because people, the basic rule of advice is when you really need it, you can't take it, you can't hear it, and when you are in a place where you could hear it, you don't usually need it. Because when we're settled down, we're really bright. When we're settled down, we're pretty responsive. When we settle down, we have a lot of common sense. And he settled down so much that by the end of the second day, I said, do you think you could get your wife to come out? And he said, why? And I said, because I think if you go home now, without any context, she's gonna think that you've been faking it for all these months. Because he was like a different guy. And so she flew out, and she came in the next morning, and I thought she'd be really excited. I thought she'd be really happy that her husband was kind of like, had found his peace. She freaking attacked him. She was like, well, you know, how do you know this is gonna last? And, and I'm sitting there going, shit, you know. But, but, but he was so cool because he was present. And he wasn't up in the dream. He'd woken up for the moment. And he said, well, look, I don't, but it, I kind of get it. I kind of get where I went, even though I've been gone for a while. I kind of get it was nothing to do with the business, right? I, he'd been in that business for 20 years. It wasn't the business. But he'd gotten caught up in the fantasies. He'd gotten caught up in the fears. He'd gotten caught up in the insecurities. That dream had gotten so real that he was stuck in it. Right? And he woke up. That's all that happened. And so his wife grilled him for about an hour. And she was like, well, are you still going to sell the company? And he said, it depends. Not at the price we've been offered. But when we sit down, if it's that below this number, no. If it's in this range of numbers, maybe. And if it's above that number, yeah, actually, it'd be great. And literally, whatever she said to try and unsettle him, right? You know your partner's buttons? She was pressing them like, why are the buttons not working, <laughs> right? You know, you could see she was trying to get him off. But he was awake. You can't press a dream button when somebody's awake. When you're caught up, anything will set you off. But when you're not, you tend to just take things in your stride. And she started to settle down. Because, of course, she was in a dream, too. She was in a dream of a terrifying future where she was stuck with crazy guy for the rest <laughs> of her life. Right? Well, when they both settled down, it was kind of a done deal. I didn't know what was going to happen, but I knew it would be as good as it gets. Right? You still can't guarantee outcomes. Life doesn't work that way. I, I, I had a high school physics teacher I tell this story. I sometimes get in trouble for this story, so bear with. Um, and he used to say, if, 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 if you kick a football and, and I, I measure your leg speed and the air speed and depending where on the earth we are, I can predict where that football will come to rest within a, a millimeter. He said, but if you kick a dog, there's no telling where it's going to wind up. <laughs> because it's a living system. Business is a living system. We do our best, we play the game, we tilt the odds, and we hope for the best. That's all we ever do. All we can ever do is up the probability. I talked with an incredibly successful guy who ran seven companies, three of which were going public at the time that he was with me. I was like, wow. But he was kind of awake. He wasn't that freaked out, even though I, when I went up in my head immediately when he told me about it, I was like, I don't know how I would do that. That sounds really crazy. I, I got lost in a dream for a minute. But he wasn't. He was pretty present with it. He was pretty cool with it. And he just was kind of wanting to explore. He didn't have a problem as such. He just thought, I wonder if I could enjoy this more. You know, he knew how to succeed. And I said, how much control do you think you have over how things turn out? And he's funny, he didn't even pause for breath. He said, 51%. <laughs> he's like, okay, why? He said, well, he said, it's, I, he said, there's a lot of things in business, I can tell, just aren't up to me. He said, but I only need 51% to tilt the odds to the point where I would be banned from every casino in Vegas. Right? We only need a tiny little edge to tilt the odds in our favor. We're not going to win every hand. It's not the nature of the game. 
But if we can tilt the odds in our favor even a little bit, we're going to do pretty well. So, happy ending to this particular story. <coughs> Six weeks later, I get a call. The guy sold his business, made a, a, I think it was about a $6 million profit above the original valuation of the company. Went on to open a, um, about a year later, I heard back from him, he opened a, uh, a bar and cinema. <laughs> and he's loving it. He was a movie buff. So it was kind of cool. Now, he didn't come to me because I want to give up my company and open a bar and cinema. He just came because he got that the way he was doing it wasn't working. I didn't teach him how to do his business because I don't know how to do his business. I know how to do my business. Right? We go to business gurus, to business coaches. Well, what do I do? What's best practice? Well, somebody else's best practice probably isn't best practice for you. Somebody else's best advice for what they did probably won't be that relevant to you, though there may be bits of it that are helpful. What's helpful is for you to be able to show up clean to your business, to show up fresh, to show up alive. And then you're going to do as well as you can do. If you can be settled down in the midst of it, you're going to do pretty well. And that's as good as it gets. That's, that's what's on offer. Not, how do I make sure I win? Well, cheat. It's pretty much the only way. <laughs> but how do I love it? How do I do as well as I'm going to do? Show up alive. Show up clean. Start to get a feel for what it feels like when you're lost in the thought, when you're lost in the dream, when you're caught up in scary fantasies about imaginary futures and trying to prevent them or avoid them or ensure that something happens. It's a very different feeling. Do you guys have some sense of what I mean? I'm going to tell a couple other stories about it. But so, second client example. I had a woman come to me. She was, again, sent by, by her company. And her, her, her problem was she, she was she was worried that she was a victim of the Peter Principle. You know, the Peter Principle that in, in business, everybody is eventually promoted to a, a position where they're doomed to fail. They're promoted to their own level of incompetence. <laughs> and so she'd been, worked her way up through a marketing department, had become the head of the marketing department, and had gotten promoted to COO of a fairly large company, 150 employees. So not huge, but, but pretty large by a lot of our standards if we're small business owners. And she was freaking. She said, and she had her list of all the different problems. And again, if I was supposed to know how to solve those, I would have been in trouble. But I knew she probably could figure it out because it was her business. Like she was in it. She had the data. She just had no access to her own intelligence for the time being. And she said, I mean, how do real COOs cope? And I was like, well, they take drugs, they have affairs, their marriages fail, they get ill, and then they die. <laughs> and she looked at me kind of like, that's your recommendation? <laughs> And I said, no, your question wasn't what would I suggest. It was how do normal COOs cope? <laughs> well, I said, it doesn't have to be like that. And we had a conversation about who we are at core, who human beings are at core. And if I ask somebody typically, well, who are you? They'll give me their name. They'll give me their job. They might give me their, their personal history. They might give me their job title. They might give me their religion. They might give me their race. They might give me their nationality. Right? They'll make a, a list of characteristics, a list of experiences. Well, that's not who you are. Right? I can find lots of people who'll fit that list. I used to say, remember The Secret? Where, where part, so when The Secret came out, it was a huge multi-million selling video series and book series. And the basic idea was that you could attract your ideal life by thinking the right thoughts. And you could attract your ideal mate by making a list of all the characteristics you were looking for in a mate. And it was amazing for the next few years how many people I, m I, I met who had met their exes that way. Because <laughs> the one thing nobody ever put on the list was, I actually like them. Right? So they get people who totally fit the list, 
But it wasn't what they really wanted, which was somebody that they could enjoy being with. <laughs> you know, it was crazy. It's like, go figure. <laughs> but, um, it's actually quite fun. I can tell this story because he tells it on the news, but y you know Paul McKenna? So Paul's been a dear friend for years and years and years, and he credits me with helping him find his wife. I just had dinner with him on Friday. And here's the actual conversation Paul and I had, right? He was complaining about his love life, right? I've known him since 1980-something, right? So I've watched his love life. It's very good magazine fodder. Right? <laughs> and, 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 and he said, he said, yeah, I just, you know, you know, what do you think I'm doing wrong? And I said, well, and I'm trying to be really tactful. And I was like, I think you might be picking the wrong women. <laughs> <laughs> you know, as the latest Brazilian supermodel walked out, right? And, and, and he said, well, what do you think? I, and quite defensive, like, well, what do you think I should look for? And I said, I don't know, somebody you like? Now, I was kind of joking, but he'd never thought of that. <laughs> you, can, you might say, well, how could he never think of that? I mean, that's obvious. Yeah, it's obvious when you're not caught up in the dream. Everything's obvious when you're not caught up. Life's pretty obvious when you're not caught up. It's just we spend most of our time caught up. Literally, he said in that moment, in this Mexican restaurant in Tarzana, where, where, where I was living, he thought of somebody who is now his wife, who he'd known for years. Just had never occurred to him that was a criteria for a relationship. <laughs> Again, not, we're all really smart or really thick, depending on how caught up we are about something. So you might be, now I also meet people who in their business are brilliant and their personal lives, good Lord, and people who have really lovely personal lives, but in their businesses, good Lord. And it's simply to do with how caught up are they in their heads, as opposed to present to the aliveness, present to the humans, present to the intelligence in them, present to the creativity in us. So I was working with the COO, and we're just talking about, again, <coughs> who are we at core if we're not this list? of characteristics and qualities and historical experiences. Who are we? So think about, uh, I can't remember the name of the philosopher, but there was a British philosopher who wrote a paper on the university. And, and he said, imagine that somebody who's never been to a, a civilized society comes in and said, I've heard there's a lovely university here. Could you show me the university? What would you show them? Well, you'd show them the buildings, but the buildings aren't the university. You might show them the professors and students, but they're not the university. You might show them the, the sweatshirts with the name of the university on it, but that's not the university. Where's the university? Well, it's kind of the same with us. We can show all the constituent bits and pieces, but in a way, what makes us us, or a university a university, or a business a business, is the spirit of it. The spirit of the university is the university. The spirit of a business, like, show, show me your business. You can show me your premises, but that's not your business. You can show me your, your books, but that's not your business. You can show me some of your customers, but they're not your business. You can show me your staff, but they're not your business. Your business is an aliveness. It's a shared aliveness. It's a spirit. Well, same with us. Show me who you are. Well, here. No, 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 that's your body. Well, I believe in these things and value these things. Great, that's your thinking. Well, you can't show me who you are, but I can feel you. I can feel the aliveness in you. I can feel the spirit in you. I can tell the difference between people without knowing anything about them, and you can too. I have, I have next door neighbors. I live in, I live in LA. And you know, so there's a lot of very different people in LA. And I live next to some very fundamentally religious people. They're, they're very sweet, but they have some views that aren't quite the same as mine about life. And one of those views is that uh, psychic phenomena are evil. And they were worried that what I was doing might be 
psychic, so they wanted to make sure that I wasn't evil. Um, <laughs> And, and, I, and I said, well, what do you mean? And I said, well, you know, you, you, you know some of the stuff you talk about sounds right on the edge. And, 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 I, I, and I said, and I was joking, but I said, but you're psychic. And she looked horrified. She said, I am not. And I said, but when your husband comes home, can't you tell what kind of day he's had before he opens his mouth? Yes. Well, that sounds psychic to me. And don't you sometimes know what he's going to say before he says it? Yes. That. And I suddenly saw she thought I was the devil, so I stopped. <laughs> but fundamentally, right, we do feel people. We feel ourselves. We, we kind of know when we're there and when we're not. We get a feel for it when we're a little bit present. And so it was quite funny. So Because she, she, again, once she kind of relaxed into it and stopped thinking, I've got to be a COO now and just realized, oh, it's just me with a different job title. And there's some different things I'm being asked to do, and actually I'm pretty competent. That's the res there was a reason she got promoted. And actually I can probably figure this out, and she began to thrive in that position. And it was interesting because I remember what she asked me on the last day, because she was now excited to go back. She wanted to see, well, what's, what's it gonna be like now that I'm not terrified? I wonder what, I'll, what my experience will be. And she wanted to kind of, uh, I can't remember the name she had for it, but she wanted to sort of like visualize what it would be like when she got back. And I said, I don't know that you can. Because the business you were in when you left was made up out of all your busy thinking. And you're going back without that thinking, so you have no idea what you'll see. It's not like there's a real thing out there and you're the one changing. The whole thing is continually up for grabs. Because aren't there some days where your business is this beautiful, handsome, pretty boy-girl thing, and you just love it? And other days where it's a hideous monster that's just waiting to eat your children? <laughs> right? It's not really either of those things. But it really feels like it. And so she began to see that really the best we can ever do is show up. But show up clean. Show up alive, show up with as little noise in our heads as we can, which will vary, because some days there's just going to be a lot of noise in your head, and respond. Because what every human being has at their core is a real-time responsive intelligence. We can call it innate intelligence, we can call it wisdom, we can call it instinct, we can call it intuition, but everybody has that knowing, that inner knowing. And probably you rely on it a tiny percentage of the time. Because you follow the, the, you go by the book. Well, this is how business is supposed to work, right? This is how it worked. I joined a Vistage group. Some of you know Vistage? So I joined a Vistage group in LA for CEOs because I wanted to see how real business people did it because I clearly wasn't a real business person, because you know, I was an actor, for God's sake. Right? I went to drama school. And, and I was kind of amazed to see, oh, they're just like me. They don't really have a clue. <laughs> but the ones who are good at it are kind of happy to make it up as they go along, and the ones who aren't think they need to work it out ahead of time. I get that. We've all got this extraordinary capacity, a responsive intelligence. People are really good at eating the food on their plate. Try eating what was on your plate yesterday. We can't do it. Try eating what you think is going to be on your plate tomorrow. Can't do it. We're not made to do that. We're made to eat what's on our plate now. And I sometimes, I, I, I have different ways that I try to describe this. Because everybody recognizes it, but sometimes the words throw people. And, and so one of the ways I sometimes describe it is, it, it's like a magical refrigerator. Where when you're not hungry, there's nothing in there. But when you're hungry, exactly what you need is right there. The mind is like that. When we think, yeah, but what would I do if this happened? What would I do if that happened? How would I deal with this? How would I deal with that? That creativity can't kick in. It's not made for that. All we've got is our memory and imagination. When we're really in the situation, 
we got everything we need. Suddenly, we know what to do. Something comes to mind. We surprise ourselves by how much we know what to do. Most people are brilliant in crisis, to their own surprise. It may not be in business, but there are times in your life where you have been in over your head, where if I told you it was gonna happen, you would have freaked, but when you're actually there, you deal with it really well. Because somehow when we have to, we put all the thinking away, and we just deal with what's in front of us. But we don't, it doesn't occur to us we can do that anytime. We don't need to be in crisis to make use of this real-time responsive intelligence. And so that business is thriving. She is thriving in her role as COO. Simply because it's not like I gave her anything, bless you, she didn't already have. I showed her how the equipment worked. And that was enough. I showed her the door slides. It doesn't open. It doesn't pull in. <laughs> it slides. Oh, got it. That's how close you are. Right? That's how straightforward this is. That's why you're on your game when you're on your game, and that's why you are pathetic when you're not. Same as me, same as everybody else. I, I gave a talk, on a, uh, I gave a TED talk, uh, I've given a few, but this was uh, five years ago now, and, and it was, it's very popular, thanks to Marcus and Fountain, we, 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 we have now gone over a million views on the TED talk. And one of the people who was on the stage uh, in the same set of TED Talks as me, it was a guy named Bob Hurley. Anyone heard of Hurley clothing? So Hurley is one of the largest leisure wear manufacturers in the world. Um, he, he developed it, he was a surfer dude. And like even when we walked in, I didn't know who he was, but I was with my son, I brought my son with me, he was 19 at the time. And we both picked this guy out, because he's an older guy, bit of a paunch, gray hair, giant baseball cap that looked like a hip hop singer should have had it, and a blue sports coat. And I was like, that's an interesting look, <laughs> right? And, and it turned out it was this guy, and he'd sold his business to Nike for 250 million. And it's a huge, huge business. And he very kindly, because uh, his son was there as well, took my son and I to dinner after the talk. And uh, there, there were two things from that dinner that really struck me. The first was Oliver, my son, asked him, what's your secret? How have you been so successful? What are the skills that have helped you to, to, to thrive. And I was curious too. Um, and, and Bob said, I don't know. He said, I'm kind of like Mr. Magoo. You guys know Mr. Magoo? He was like this mostly blind cartoon character who just kind of somehow he'd step off the edge of a building just as a plane was flying by and would carry him over here and then he'd fall off the plane just as a truck with carrying soft things would, you know, it was, he was that kind of character. In other words, one thing just somehow leads to another. That's how it is for all of us. We can make up stories about it, but somehow we keep putting one foot in front of the other and somehow we wind up somewhere way beyond what we imagined. And, and Oliver said, well, is that it? And he said, well, I'm pretty good at math. <laughs> right, and that's helpful too, right? It's helpful to know how the numbers add up. So that just struck me. And I get it could have been false humility, but I also got, no, that's pretty much what it looks like to him. He just kept doing what made sense to him and it kept working. If you, if you ever get interested, you can read his biography and his story of how the, the deal with Nike went is kind of hysterical. Because he was like, you know, the, 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 the night before his CFO said, do you want me to review your slide presentation? And he said, slide presentation? <laughs> <laughs> Give you some sense of how it went, <laughs> right? Well, the other thing that I always remember from that is he came up to me at the end of the meal and he said, do you mind if I give you some feedback on your presentation? Because I talked in the presentation. If you watch it, it's called Why Aren't We Awesome? And I, I kind of talk about how the mind works. I talk about how we make up realities and then get stuck in them. And it sits on top of this very natural intelligence, this very natural well-being, this very natural clarity of mind that kind of comes factory preset. And he said, I really enjoyed it, but it's kind of common sense, isn't it? And I went, yeah but it's amazing how uncommon it is in practice. And it's only uncommon because we think there's more to it. We think it can't be that simple. Actually, based on 32 years of work, it really is that simple. 
<laughs> it's just sometimes the dreams look really complicated, right? They look like there's a lot of moving parts. And yeah, it's different for me because I get that, right? I don't know your story, right? I'm sure if you're, especially if you're really in it right now, you, you, I probably sound like I'm being flip about it. I, I get that. But I also promise you I've heard worse. And I promise you, it doesn't matter how bad the dream is once you wake up. So I, I want to tell you one more story and then I, I want to take a few questions if they're out there. So I like to think I'm pretty good at this. Right? Apparently I'm world class. I heard the introduction. I sound amazing. <laughs> right? But in 2015, my, my business was really struggling. It was as close as we've ever come to bankruptcy. And it was, it was twofold. One was something was off in our strategy and it took me a little while to work out what that was, but it, something was off and, and it wasn't working. But the other was math, right? We had, and I don't, the numbers won't be exact, but essentially um, we, were, we had $90,000 in outstanding invoices for a month and we had about $85,000 in, in invoices that we needed to pay, which to me looked great. Like, I can do that, five. We have five, <laughs> right? But nobody paid, literally nobody. I've never had that before. And as, as our invoices came due, the juggling was getting harder and harder and more and more stressed. And I kept thinking, boy, thank God I understand this, or I would be even more stressed than I am now. And I went to people who I respect, coaches who work the same way that I work, but who weren't me, because I knew it's easier from outside the story to see it. And, and I said to them, and it's funny, I'm realizing, because of course this is what the COO said to me. I said to them, how do real CEOs handle this? <laughs> and they said, what do you mean? And I said, well look, my company, it had, we had like seven people at the time, we had a low seven figure turnover. It was like, I, it's great, but it's, not like a huge company. And I was thinking, well, you know, I understand all this about the mind and about who we are and about our real-time responsive intelligence and that all this insecurity is just made of thought and it's not real and it's like a dream and once you see through it, you're back and you're good as new and I'm barely hanging on here. How do companies with billions of turnover and thousands of employees and, 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 and all that, how do they deal with it? Because in my mind, right, if it was this bad at my size company, how bad, would, how much worse would it be with a bigger company? And I knew all this stuff about the mind. And they looked at me like I was a little nuts and they said, they deal with it variably. And I had an insight. I woke up from the dream. See, I thought my understanding of the mind was helping me cope with the incredibly stressful situation I was in. I suddenly realized, no, it's my utter lack of understanding of the mind that makes it look like a stressful situation. <laughs> it's just a cash flow issue. All businesses have them. No biggie. It's kind of the, the nature of the beast, right? If you don't want to have cash flow issues, you might not want to have a business, right? I, I've got a friend who says it's, it's like a busboy complaining about too many dishes. It's kind of the gig. But somehow in my head, in my dream, I thought, no, real problem, real source of stress outside of thought, not dream, must handle. <laughs> well, I woke up. Didn't mean to, right? I just woke up. I saw it for what it was. I stopped freaking out. Now, here's an important point. I still owed money. <laughs> I still had invoices to collect. But because I wasn't freaked out, things started to occur to me to do, to bridge the gap. And I took care of it, and like most things, if you don't <laughs> go under, you grow through. And the business began to grow. And then once I sort of cottoned on to the fact that, oh, I wonder if everything else I think is a real problem is made of thought, is made of the dream. I took a fresh look at the business. And I realized that even though on paper, even though my Vistage group loved my business plan, I didn't. 
I wasn't in love with it. It would have worked, or at least the odds were it would have worked. But I didn't want to do it. And so I let go of a couple of people. A couple of people left. We had a bit of a tough transition. And then the business turned around and has just soared. And it soared not because I've suddenly gotten smarter, but because I'm in love with it. <laughs> and very different things come out of me now. And I have a very different experience of it. And I look forward to spending time in it instead of <sighs> back to work. Doesn't mean I don't have bad days. Just means I don't think they're indicative of a fundamental problem. I think they're indicative of sometimes people have bad days. And that's just the truth of business as I see it. We have an amazing amount going for us. But we always seem to think that what we're up against is out there. That the problem is out there. I'm not saying there aren't things you have to deal with out there. I'm saying they're not your problem. They're just what you have to deal with. Your problem is always getting lost in the dream, getting caught up in your head. I I'll, I'll give you one last analogy. And then whoever I told I'd stop at 7.30, I was lying because we're going to do questions now. Um, that's all right? Yeah, okay. So imagine that Bill Gates comes to you for business coaching. But he has amnesia. He doesn't know. That's why he comes because he, he, he's just like, and you recognize him. And you're like, I think he's Bill Gates. And he's like, yeah, he has amnesia. Don't wake him up. Right? Um, well, if Bill Gates came to you with amnesia asking for business advice, would you give him best practice for your business or would you try to remind him of who he really is? My guess is you'd try and remind him of who he really is, kind of knowing that if he woke back up to that, he'd figure the rest out. That's the secret of why I can do what I do with people who have businesses far bigger than mine, who are far more successful than I ever need to be, who do things that I would never know how to do. Because I know I don't have to show them how to do it. I just have to wake them up from the dream of all the scary thinking and wake them up to that deeper aliveness at the heart of who they are. I just gave away the secret. <laughs> Damn it. So. I'd love to take some questions if they're out there. So are, do we have a microphone? How are we doing this? Is there a... Uh, just, just speak up loudly. Yeah. Raise a hand. Up, Starting there, sir. Hi. Hi. Uh, You'll be next. Really interesting, and thanks for sharing that. Um, I've got two connected questions. Mm -hmm. One is, what sort of age did that thought process start with you? And the connected bit of that is, why aren't we just teaching this in education? So, uh, 43? <laughs> but hell, it could have been worse. <laughs> right? There's an, there's an old joke that I love about a, uh, an old woman standing in line at uh, registration day at a university for med school. And, uh, you know, as they're waiting in line, as you do, one of the, the young women in front of her t turns to talk to her and says, oh, are you holding a place for your granddaughter? She goes, no, 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 I'm, 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 I'm going to be going here. And the woman says, well, if you don't mind my asking, how old are you? Oh, 63. You know, you're going to be 70 by the time you become a doctor. She said, well, God willing, I'm going to be 70 anyways. I may as well be a doctor. <laughs> So that's part, that, that's, that's part one. <laughs> Was there a part two? Sorry. I yeah, the, the education bit. The education bit. So I'm not doing an education because there are people who are doing this in education who I support. So there are some amazing educational initiatives. There's one called the Spark Initiative, which has just become uh, doubly evidence-based in the U.S., which means that it's about to become much more pervasive in the educational system. There's another one called iHeart, which is based in the U.K., and there are, a, there are an increasing number of educational initiatives. So I'm not because others are. Yeah. Thank you. Sir. You mentioned in the event of your own cash flow issues that you went to someone else external to yourself just because mm. it's so much easier to see yeah. you from the outside than yeah. yourself from within the machine. What's your advice to someone who probably is 
guilty of finding yourself in that same situation where from the inside you just can't see mm. yourself with the clarity from mm. the outside. What, what, what can I do? What can a person do in that situation to get that external clarity? Well, here's the thing. And I know it was just, you just said it, right? It's a funny thing to feel guilty about, right? We fall asleep and we, and we dream. Never going to not happen. We're alive, we're aware, but we think. So part, part of it is just getting, yeah, that's what people do. So there's nothing on it. It's not like I should be able to work this out myself. Well, that's a nice idea. But the second is, if you can see that you're probably caught up and it would be helpful to have somebody outside you, you're already a little bit awake. Because if you weren't a little bit awake, it wouldn't occur to you that you might need to wake up. So in a way, look, you know, I have books, I have videos, I have programs. There's all that. There are other coaches who work the way I work. There's all that. But by the time it occurs to you that you could use us, you probably don't need us. Yeah. So early on in the talk you said um, maybe some of you are here because uh, uh, you like making money. Mm -hmm. and you I do too, by the way. Right, yeah. okay. Uh, and you encouraged us to fall in love with our businesses or fall in love with our mm -hmm. lives. And that seemed to me a great um, aspiration. And one that works for me. But isn't there a contradiction between the two? Surely you, if you really are in love with your business, mm. then there has to be something fundamental about it, mm. which has nothing to do with making money. Something to do with the quality of the business itself mm. or with what it's doing for good in the world or something. Well, you know the expression for the love of the game? <clears throat> Sometimes it's just the love of the game. And in terms of the money, I, I don't know, how many of you are married, right? H how many of you said vows that include the phrase for richer and for poorer, right? It's still pretty common, right? The, the love isn't dependent on the money, but the money doesn't get in the way of the love. There's no contradiction inherent in it. I guess what I was trying to say was, isn't the idea of falling in love with your business necessarily an idea which which, let's put it this way, is not coincident with aspiring after making money. If, if you make money, then that, that's going to be some kind of effect, ex almost accidental effect, of it, being it, really in love with it. it. It can be. It depends on the business. There, there are absolutely businesses where the person so loves the service that that's, that's the bit that they really love. There are others where people genuinely love the game of making money. I've worked with some incredibly wealthy people who run essentially investment funds. <coughs> and they love what they do, but they love it for different reasons. So as it happens, I worked at a certain point with three investment fund owners. And they had various funds ranging from 100 million up over a billion. And they had three completely different reasons that they they loved it. One of them absolutely just thought it was the coolest game in the world to make money. They just thought it was fun coming up with ways to, to beat the markets and to, and to do it. And that was it, as best I could tell. It was really clean. They didn't have any judgment on it. They didn't have any problem with it. That was their thing. Another one really, really, really cared about the clients. Like I'd never seen it to that degree before. Like just really wanted the best for every single person who invested money with him. And that drove him. And it actually drove him a little nuts at first. But once he kind of woke up from that, he really just enjoyed being a steward of their money. That became a really meaningful thing to him. Another one, I'm trying to think how I would, how I would, I would sum it up. She was really good at it. She was very successful at it. But what she loved was being a woman in a, 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 a really high, I don't want to say high powered like it was a power thing, but a really influential role in what has traditionally being a, been a man's world. And she loved exploring what was possible for women through what she was doing. 
and it happened that that was her expertise. Now, all three of them loved it. All three of them were incredibly successful, but there were three different aspects that really lit them up about it. So that, that's <laughs> kind of all I got, is just examples. But it, like, why do you love the person that you love, the people that you love? My guess is it's not any one thing. My guess it's you love the feeling of engaging with them. You really enjoy their company. You love who you are when you're with them most of the time, right? So there's that. Yeah. Um, I'd like to, I was, I, as you were talking, I was thinking about this fine line between the problems we're facing and mm. that you know, we creatively solve as opposed to the dream that we are in. It, isn't there that it's, it's easy to get sort of caught between the two or if there is a lot of problems that you need to solve, you might tip over to your dream. So do you have any examples of how to, you know, when you're in a cognitive profession yeah. where this, your job is to think about problems mm -hmm. and don't you kind of help, don't you kind of solve them if you've thought about them for a long time, you know, that you wake up at 4 a.m. and you have the solution. Mm -hmm. The only way you could have solved it is because you've actually been going at it and going at it all day long. So it's an, that, is a, that is an interesting and common theory. Okay. That, that, in fact, I remember a book came out. So there's a guy named Herbert Benson, and he wrote a book called, uh, I think it was called The Relaxation Response, which became one of the first popular mainstream books about meditation as a non-esoteric practice. And then he wrote another book called The Breakthrough Principle, how people have breakthrough ideas. And I worked in the book trade when I first started out. So I ran the biggest psychology bookshop in London when I was over here, Changes Bookshop. And I knew that book was coming and I could not wait. I was so excited. Somebody was gonna finally tell me, how do you have breakthrough innovations and ideas? And, I, and I, the day the book came in, I was the first person in, in England to read it. So I ripped open the box, I grabbed the book and I'm like, I'm on break. And I flipped through to find the formula. And the four-step formula, as I remember it, this won't be exactly right, was um, identify the problem, obsess about the problem, stop obsessing, the answer will come. <laughs> now, that's true, but it's kind of made up how long you're supposed to obsess. I, I, I worked with a, a company, a guy, the guy who ran a company, and they, they had had a major, major challenge that came to a head where basically after two and a half weeks of the brightest minds in, <coughs> in the company working on a problem and the military, there was a military company and the military breathing down their neck, the CEO said, you know what, go home guys. We're, this is silly. We're killing ourselves here. There's no point. And he came in the next morning to kind of fall on his sword and he got in early to the office at 6 a.m. And he walked in and there were other cars in the car park, which there normally weren't. And it turned out a bunch of the engineers had come back in because in the middle of the night, they'd all kind of woken up with an idea, which wound up solving the problem. He wound up leaving that company and becoming a consultant and years later went back to the company and a couple of the engineers were still there. And he talked to them and he said, you know, what, what's still going on from the old days? And he said, oh, that technique we learned with you, we still do. I said, what technique? <laughs> Giving up, <laughs> right? And, he, and it, so apparently, like when they have an engineering challenge or they have an issue at the company, at some point, if somebody's really struggling, they go, have you given up yet? <laughs> oh, I forgot, brilliant. <laughs> and he said the two things that struck him, the engineer said this, he said the two things that really struck him is it worked every time and they were surprised that it worked every time. <laughs> <laughs> so when you do that often, then there is a tendency to then live in your head. That's what's my... Yeah, and, and, and when you see that it's the moment you get out of your head, yeah. then you don't have to stay in your head that long. So yes, you have to look at it. You have to sit with it, but you don't have to obsess about it. Uh, I saw another hand, yes. No pressure, but we're going to finish with you, so make it good. <laughs> um, uh, in my coaching, I use a lot of sporting analogies mm -hmm. in you know, team and everything. Mm -hmm. Do you do any work with sports people? Or do I, I do a little. I, to be honest, I mostly work with sports coaches more, more than with, with athletes. I've worked with some golfers. Um, but it's interesting because it's the exact same thing. 
In fact, in some ways, people in a pure performance industry get it quicker. I was telling a story earlier about a tennis player who um, is kind of known for his cool, like for not being caught up in the game. And a friend of mine was, was sitting with him, got a chance to sit with him at an event and said, do you mind if I ask you some questions? And, and, and the guy said, sure. He said, well, how are you so cool on the court? I said, I, I don't really think I'm that cool on the court. I said, well, you've never like lost a point because you lost your, your mind. Like I said, I've lost whole matches because I got up in my head. And he said, well, why doesn't it show more? Like, why, why aren't you more histrionic? Like, why aren't you throwing John McEnroe hissy fits? <laughs> and, and the guy said, well, he said, to be honest, I'm here to play tennis. I don't really care how I feel. See, we think the most important thing is being in the right state of mind or getting this or getting that. No, if you want to be good at business, be good at business. And yeah, from time to time, you'll get caught up and it'll get in the way. And then you'll wake back up to who you are at core, to the aliveness at the core of your being, to the real-time responsive intelligence that guides us through everything anyways. And you'll do as well as it is possible for you to do. You're welcome. Thanks, everybody. and have a chance to head back upstairs and chat to each other and maybe ask Michael some questions if he's around and just generally enjoy the rest of our evenings. I just wanted to mention a few things. Uh, Marcus has already mentioned that there are some free books around of, the, of Michael's books and they please do pick up a copy as you head out and if there's one you haven't read, then definitely grab that one. Um, the other thing I want to say was a really big thank you to Naked Wines who have sponsored this evening's event with uh, beautiful wine upstairs. So if you didn't get the chance to enjoy it, I'm not sure if it will still be around. Yep, there's more wine upstairs, so um, do enjoy it. But uh, a huge thank you for the support and uh, sponsorship of this event to Naked Wines. And Naked Wines are going to be part of our next event, which is another Culture Shock evening, which will be back at the UEA in September. And I'm really excited because we've just had confirmation that one of the speakers who I'm going to get to interview on stage is Stuart Weber from Norwich City. He's the uh, director of football, and he's going to be talking about building culture at uh, Brazil. I mean, Norwich City. <laughs> hard to tell the difference. Yeah, exactly. They, they look the same, same colour shirts. Um, so yeah, so we, we're going to, um, and Naked Ones are going to be involved on stage as well, talking about building culture in, uh, in our local businesses and our local environment. So I hope that you'll join us um, for that event as well. It's on the 25th of September at the UEA. Um, I just want to say another huge thank you to Michael for coming up, not only for this evening, but for the whole day of working with the Fountain team. Um, it's been a real honour to have you. So thank you so much. Thank you.